welcome everybody. Great to have you here. We're gonna be starting just in one minute. Looking forward to today's session. We'll just kind of let uh, everybody enter the room. And uh, Jonathan, do we have uh, Danilo in the room? If, if so, can we add him as a panelist? I'm gonna check. No, yeah. Is he there? No, he's not on the list. OK, no worries. We'll go ahead and get started. And uh, we just keep an eye out for him and let me know if he joins. Yes. Perfect, perfect. All right. Well, um, I'm going to share my screen here momentarily, and we'll get started. Thanks, everybody, uh, for coming today. And uh, really appreciate your time and attention. And so. Oops. Uh, and Jonathan, are we uh, recording? Yes, we are recording now. All right, perfect. All right, welcome everyone. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the CEO and founder of BizHack Academy and the host of today's masterclass, part of the Digital Marketing Masterclass series, season seven, how to plan for success in 2023. Um, and I want to just say to you guys that um, we're entering a recession. 98% uh, of CEOs in large companies are preparing for a recession. Uh, there is a chance that something drastic will change, but everyone should be preparing right now for it. And that's really the theme and focus uh, of this entire season in today's session with Russ Sorrells uh, of Pinnacle. And uh, I wanted to just remind you of this great kind of old-timey quote from Henry Ford. Uh, a person who stops advertising to save money is like a person who stops a clock to save time. The idea here is that during a downturn, you need to get more aggressive, not less, with your marketing. You need to become more intentional, not less, with your advertising and promotion. Now is an opportunity for you to gobble up market share and grow. And the number one thing you need to do in a time like this is be prepared. That is what this series of four masterclasses is all about. This is the third of four sessions. In one week, we're gonna be talking about communications magic during a downturn, how to communicate with your employees, your investors, your staff, your customers, your vendors, uh, during a downturn, how to be effective at your communications, Communication strategy is the core uh, of, of how you communicate your values to all of your stakeholders, and marketing is just one piece of it. This is, as I said, the third of four sessions. In the first session, we borrowed some of the best practices from Silicon Valley. We talked about the lean startup methodology and the blue ocean, red ocean strategy. In session two, we talked about EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System, uh, based on the book Traction by Gina Wick Wickman. Uh, fantastic, uh, simple way to get your, your company organized. Today, we're going to use one of the strategy tools that Russ uses with his clients in getting you ready for a downturn and then helping figure out some immediate action items you can take in order to respond to that. And then next week, as, the, as I mentioned, we're gonna talk about communications. Today, we're gonna talk with Russ about the downturn readiness battle plan. There's two aspects to that. The first is the discovery, that's one tool. 
and the next is the action plan, and that's a different tool. So we're going to show you how a really seasoned coach works with businesses. And the kind of thing he's doing is the sort of thing he charges $500 an hour for. And what he does is he'll run us through an assessment. Uh, we'll all assess ourselves for our discovery of where our weaknesses are, and then he'll run you through a tool to help you figure out what to do about it. I want to thank and acknowledge the Office of the Mayor of Miami-Dade County and their Strive 305 initiative, uh, our great partner, Danilo Vargas, from the, Equity, the Office of Equity and Inclusion. Uh, I also want to acknowledge our media sponsor, South Florida PBS and the Health Channel, as well as all of the promotional partners who have helped spread the word uh, about this amazing service. Many of you are here uh, thanks to them. Uh, a lot of you know me, some of you don't. I'm a business storyteller. My name is Dan Gretsch. I spent nearly 20 years as a journalist at the highest levels of media organizations like NPR, PBS, and the Miami Herald. And then the last 10 years I've dedicated to helping businesses tell their purpose-driven business story to help them attract more clients and grow their company. Um, as part of this session, and everybody pay attention because everyone always asks about this, you will be getting two handouts um, that Russ has prepared that you can use to build the, the, these are handouts that walk you through the tools that we're gonna be using. You can share these with your team, even schedule some time with your team to go over these internally. You also get a link to this recording. You can share that with your team as well in preparation for the sessions you're gonna do internally. Uh, you're gonna uh, also get automatic registration to the fourth masterclass of season seven, as well as all the great masterclasses in se seasons eight, nine, and 10 that we have planned in 2023. And we do offer a scholarship program for uh, BIPOC and women-owned businesses uh, to help defray some of the costs of our paid training. Our next course, the Digital Marketer's Edge, starts in January. And if you're interested in applying for those scholarships for our paid programs, you'll have a link to do that. It's bizhack.com slash apply. Uh, without further ado, I wanna welcome Russ Sorrells uh, on how to prepare for the recession, creating your downturn readiness battle plan. Russ, welcome. I hope I didn't butcher your last name too badly. And, and it's great to have you here. It's all good. I appreciate that. I appreciate the opportunity to serve your community. And hopefully as we go through this, uh, you'll find that the participants will find opportunities that they can immediately go back and apply to their businesses. That's why we're having this discussion. And that's why Dan has, has invited me on. If you haven't engaged Dan uh, as it relates to marketing and storytelling, uh, he is, he's one of the best that's out there and uh, really encourage you to take advantage of just this connection in general. So uh, without further ado here, let's uh, let's get in here and share this presentation with you. Right, and why he's getting set up. Russ and I actually met at the Entrepreneurs Organization uh, Nerve Conference, and we shared, uh, I guess it was a an Uber to the airport. And I started talking to him about Pinnacle, um, and um, they're a competitor to EOS, uh, uh, kind of built on top in some ways of EOS. And at the end of the presentation, I've asked him to share a little bit about what his four top principles are uh, for every business owner. Uh, so that's a little bit of bonus content. I uh, would ask that you stick around uh, all the way till two, uh, and you'll get those four key elements that are uh, absolutely unmissable. So uh, back to you, Russ. Excellent. We'll appreciate that. Can you see the Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So the slide. All right. Fantastic. Again, thanks for the opportunity. I look forward to sharing uh, some of this content with you uh, over the next... Uh, what, 75 minutes or so. Uh, so obviously preparing for a downturn, one of the things that I want you to keep in mind is a downturn could be a recession, which is certainly uh, something to be mindful of and take into consideration given the, the current economic climate, the challenges around supply chain and, and uh, in hiring. But there could also be a downturn in your business that's not related to a recession. You could lose your biggest client uh, you could lose uh, key employees, uh, so you could lose a contract. So there are any number of things that could affect your business in a negative way that you will absolutely benefit from uh, preparing for. So that's what we're going to talk about here today. We'll run through 
uh, some of the objectives and ideas. So we went, I want three outcomes for you today. I want you to think differently, begin to think differently about your business uh, from a strategy perspective and, and more of a, a long range uh, thinking and preparation. We want to assess your downturn readiness. How is your business prepared? How are you prepared to, um, to attack or uh, address any challenges with a, an impending downturn? And then uh, identify three areas for immediate action, and then that's where we're going to have that action plan and create. So we'll talk a little bit about me. I'll introduce myself so you know who that guy I am. Uh, we've got three keys to navigating uh, the downturn. We've got the downturn readiness assessment. We're going to discuss uh, those assessment results. Hopefully, you'll have an opportunity to uh, record or document uh, your thoughts and your main concerns as it relates to the questions we're going to ask in the assessment. We're going to use what we call a fast rock planner to outline an action plan for your business. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, pinnacle business operating system and how it might benefit uh, you and your company, and then we'll wrap up. All right, a little bit about me. So I have walked in your shoes as small business owners. I've I've built, bought, and sold six businesses in my career. Um, I am a leadership team guide now. That's what I do full time because my mission is to help people that want to help themselves live their full potential because I believe everyone wants to live their full potential, but they haven't been taught how or necessarily shown the way. So that's really what I want to empower entrepreneurs to do and individuals is to live their full potential. Uh, so I've got a diverse industry background. Manufacturing has been in that space for uh, two decades, medical. Um, so I understand that world and then consumer sector. And then uh, I also create a program, like I mentioned, specifically for helping employees of the organizations that I serve reach their full potential. And then uh, most importantly, I'm a husband, father, uh, friend, and, and coach. So uh, I'm sure you've seen these headlines. Uh, they're all over. It's uh, doom, 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 and gloom is what we hear uh, in the headlines uh, every day. Like I mentioned earlier, of course, we've got supply chain challenges. We've got a war going on, first war we've had since uh, World War II. Um, you know, it's first major war since World War II. Uh, not that the others didn't didn't matter, but uh, uh, as far as uh, significant uh, parties uh, battling, so that's a you know that's causing all kinds of disruptions and challenges and uncertainties. Uh, we've got uh, issues with uh, employees and trying to hire. I mean, that's anytime I'm getting with my clients, you know, that's the number one point of discussion is Russ. I just can't find people. I'm struggling to find the right people and and uh, and get them engaged in in my business. So we know that that those are challenges that we need to overcome or find ways to uh, work through and work around. Uh, so we we may be in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. And and what that means is there are some companies that are thriving. So if you sell luggage uh, for European vacations. You're doing great. You've you've had record years. Or if you even sell European vacations, you're having a record year because of of travel. But if you are in the retail space, um, you may have some inventory challenges that uh, that you're having to deal with and and manage through. That could be causing some challenges in uh, in your work. So each business is different as it relates to the economic challenges that uh, they're having to address. So the economy will look different in three months. It'll look different in six months. It just is constantly uh, changing. So we want to be mindful of that as business leaders when we think about our business moving forward. Uh, how does this current environment, how will that affect our business? What will the impact be uh, on our business? And then what trends will determine whether we are successful moving forward? So what adjustments do we need to make along the way? Uh, so I have a I have a video that I want to show you. So there's been a, a lot of ink spilled as it relates to managing through recessions. You know, Harvard's taken its shot at it. Uh, Bain has done its work on it. And then, uh, of course, we've got McKinsey that uh, if you're not signed up for McKinsey, McKinsey has some some really solid content. I want to show you a a quick video that uh, that really puts it into perspective. I found this to be a really helpful video for my for my clients. Uh, this is from Bain and Company. They've done an excellent job of articulating. So 
Please confirm that you can... When we look at the last downturn, one of the most dramatic economic events of the last 80 years, we actually studied 3,900 companies where 10% were really able to use the period and outperform. Those companies grew by 14% over a 10-year period from 2007 to 2017, while the other 90% were flat over that period. And when you translate that into economic terms, in terms of enterprise value growth, the difference between being one of those outperformers versus not was three times the enterprise value for the organization. One thing that the winning companies did during the last cycle was early cost management. So they did not wait for the recession to hit or the downturn in their own volume and pricing. They really managed costs well before the recession and managed it intelligently. A good example of this is Costco. They got ready for the last recession by managing costs very effectively in the store and in their entire supply chain network. They took down their SKU count dramatically, they managed in-store labor, and they took a hard look at their entire supply chain network to take costs out before the downturn hit. Another thing the winners did in the last cycle was very actively manage cash and balance sheet. So rather than just focus on P&L, they took a hard look at working capital and took out costs to create a cash war chest to get ready for the cycle. A good example of this is John Deere. During the last recession, they took a hard look at the balance sheet and were able to free up quite a bit of cash by managing working capital, refinancing long-term debt with low interest rates, and revising their entire CapEx policy to get more efficient. And as a result, they were actually able to raise their re return on capital during the cycle to an all-time high of 40%. A lot of the companies that we see grow are taking a cost and mindset and thinking about how do we drive efficiency to then reinvest in the business and drive both growth of the core and for those companies that are able to, the engine two of the organization. Samsung's a great example of this. They both looked at cost and growth. On the cost side, they reduced the number of subsidiaries to really focus the activity of the business. But during the downturn, they also increased their investment, driving up R&D 8% during the downturn, increasing the number of patents they filed by 400%, launching the first Samsung Galaxy to really reshape the business. And over the subsequent 10 years, they went from being the number 21 global brand to the number six. The last thing that we see companies do is that if they're in a position, they look aggressively at M&A. And they use this as a period to say, where do we want to make acquisitions to either fuel growth or build new capabilities for the business that we have today and the business for tomorrow? Stanley Black & Decker is a great example of this, where Stanley actually, in the last downturn, purchased the larger Black & Decker organization to increase the scale and scope of the organization. So we recommend management teams take action now before the recession hits, both a proactive cost plan to help create fuel to get through the recession, as well as a specific competitive plan to invest in the business and outperform competition, both during the cycle and after the cycle. So that is an excellent explanation of what we are going to uh, talk through in the next few minutes and uh, share some of those examples, some of those charts in our uh, presentation. So get back to the slideshow. All right, are we back? Can you see it? Fantastic. Thanks for the feedback. Sometimes you never know where you are in these things. Okay, so you heard it in that video, we've got to start now. We don't want to be in the middle of a downturn and then try to figure out how we are going to survive the downturn. The companies that thrived were the companies that started their plan before they actually got into the middle of whatever challenge they were facing. That obviously was specific tar specifically targeted to the recession, but uh, we want to be really clear on where are we exposed as business owners, identify uh, what changes we need to make uh, to mitigate that exposure, and then we want to establish really a nerve center, which is going to be, if you're a you know, smaller business, it's your uh, accountant, uh, your attorney, your trusted advisors to help guide you and hold you accountable to executing on the commitments that you determine out of any assessment or work plan that you make. Uh, so I love this. I love these two phrases here. 
It's not the plan, but the act of planning that matters most. So plans are worthless, but planning is indispensable. That is uh, obviously Dwight Eisenhower. And then uh, the next is the venerable Mike Tyson says, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Uh, love those love those things. But uh, it is important that we plan so that when we do get punched in the face, we know how to respond appropriately. Uh, so why some companies succeed during downturns? Um, it's because they make the major changes that they need. Really, it's a it's very much about that cash conservation. Um, and then, you know, identifying where the opportunities are going to be and just continuing to uh, support their customers and, and clients as a focus uh, for those people that succeed as well. And why companies succeed? Because they took action. They had a plan and they took action. So obviously, if we make a plan and we don't take any action, then we're not going to reap the rewards of creating that plan. So uh, there's some intentionally restructuring costs uh, prior to the downturn, as you heard in the video. Uh, they want to put their financial house in order. You know, cash is king. We hear that all the time. But sometimes we have uh, we, we aren't as vigilant in guarding and protecting our cash. And then, uh, you know, look to reinvest in areas where we have a competitive advantage and we can really outperform our competitors. And then we want to, uh, if possible, you know, aggressively go after the competitors that weren't mindful and intentional in preparing for a downturn. So what the 90% who don't do, don't plan do, so they respond, just as I mentioned earlier. So uh, you know, across the board, indiscriminate cost cutting, there were no plans. Most often they go after sales and marketing, which is often a, a death nail in uh, in businesses because, you know, really we, we've got, a, that's the engine that can generate the cash that we need to keep the business going. Uh, they, you know, do a Hail Mary untested strategies or they just hunker down and and wait till the recession ends. So this was uh, one of the graphs that was talked about. You can see here, this is absolutely um, just phenomenal that the companies that prepared that they were so they were so prepared to when it, as soon as they came out of the downturn, they were there. I can tell you from my example, back in 2008, we had a downturn and uh, one of the businesses that I had at the time was a, excuse me. <laughs> was a <clears throat> manufacturer's rep agency. And so what we had to do is, of course, you know, we weren't selling much equipment, but we kept getting in the market, kept getting in the market, kept getting in the market, kept seeing our clients. Even though they had nothing to buy, we continued to show up. We added value. We helped them with the manufacturing processes that we had or that they had. And we just tried to add value to the best of our ability. And when, the, when it came time, when that recession started to, to that freeze started to thaw, um, we were the first person they called. Our business grew exponentially because they were, we were top of mind. We had shown up when everyone else was waiting for the recession to end before they got back in the market. So that was uh, my own example of how it has been that. I've had that same experience. So again, we talk about the the enterprise value, the winners and the losers. Um, it's just uh, amazing. So now let's hop into the assessment. Did, did we have any questions, Dan? Were there any questions that came up? We're not, we're not listening, Dan. Sorry, can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, I have gotcha. a question from Steve Krull that I just uh, answered, but uh, it's worth. So what you've just learned is what the best of the best to do. Now we're going to take it down to the level of a small business. And we're going to give you an assessment that is kind of geared towards businesses of the size that, of the company you run. Um, and um, uh, Russ is going to walk us through it. Now, Russ, we have a online survey. Um, okay. That folks can input their answers into. Oh, wonderful! And Great. then that way, um, so let me, <clears throat> if you don't mind, uh, sh I'm going to take over sharing the screen briefly, okay. just so I can show people the the tool uh, that we've developed. 
Uh, and then what we'll do is, um, why don't you just kind of give a quick high level explanation of what people are about to go through? Yeah, so we've got uh, five questions in uh, specific areas of your business that will help you understand how prepared or unprepared you are for any uh, challenge that your business is going to face. So we're going we're gonna to talk finances. We're going to talk uh, customer relationships. We're going to talk about technology. Uh, and so those are just a few of the areas that we are going to uh, dive deep into with our questions. Yeah. So every one of you guys should open uh, the link that we just put in the chat. This is uh, not like a passive workshop. This is an interactive workshop. And when you open that link, you will see uh, this um, downturn readiness assessment form. And um, the, here are the kind of wind up, but you've already heard that. And then here you'll enter your information. And then what you're going to, uh, there are 35 questions. Uh, those 35 questions relate to seven areas. Um, those areas are uh, leadership, technology, people, customer slash vendor relationships, balance sheet, revenue, and expenses. And you're going to go through each question and you're going to put a zero, a one, or a two. Uh, let's take leadership question one. Every leader knows what function they own inside of your company, what the three to five outcomes for that function are, and has a scorecard to measure the outcomes and reports on the outcomes monthly. Now, if you have never, ever in your life thought about this, uh, put a zero. If this is something you're doing, but not perfectly, put a one. And if this is either completely not relevant to you, or you totally nail it, put a two. So if it's not relevant, put a two, don't put a zero. So for instance, if you're like, ah, you know, I, I'm a company of one, this is not relevant to me, put a two. And what we're going to do is when we do the assessment, we're going to actually go into this live spreadsheet where your responses are going to be recorded, and we are going to actually look for the zeros, right? Those are the ones where you guys need some work. And we already did this with a small group of Mosquito Joe franchises to kind of test it out. It worked great. And <clears throat> I do want you to know that your not your contact info, but your name and company name will be shared <clears throat> so that we, we can have a dynamic conversation and even invite you guys up to speak about your responses. So um, I'm gonna hand it back over uh, to, to you, Russ. Um, maybe you could walk people through the assessment as they're going through it. And we're gonna need, I guess about 15 minutes, um, right. 10 to 15 minutes to just answer the 35 questions. The faster you answer the questions, the more time we have for discussion. So I definitely would recommend, don't overthink this. You can take this again later with your team. Um, there's also a handout associated with it that we're going to be sending you as a follow-up that you can print out and hand write in uh, as an exercise. And I definitely recommend that while you do it now with us, you also bring it back to your team and do it with them. Absolutely. Uh, Russ, that's where the real that's where the real value comes is with the team. Because they're the ones that are going to be putting the process uh, into place. So while people are taking this, you all should now be answering the questions and taking the assessment, 35 questions. Um, is there any um, information or background you want to give them on the assessment itself as they're walking through it? Yeah, I just want to mention, I, I do want to give credit where credit is due. This was uh, created in conjunction with uh, Convene, which is a, uh, a group, a peer group that is a Christian-based uh, beer group, peer group, and, a, and then uh, Craig Houston is a good friend of mine down there in the Miami area. He helped uh, convene really make this assessment what it is. So while people are doing this, um, yeah, is there anything you want to you want to walk people just through? Well, I've got yeah. So if you if you want, oftentimes what I'll do is I'll just I'll ask the questions to keep the keep the progress moving. And if I ask the questions, it takes about fifteen minutes, or we can just continue to talk uh, through each of these or if any of these. Uh, highlight any of these questions come to you, however you would like to do it, Dan. My, my preference is people can read the questions and answer them at their own pace. It took us only about 10 minutes to get through it. Right. But maybe what we could do is while while people are just doing that, uh, you know, for the benefit of folks who are watching this recording, let's just talk about each, each area uh, kind of at a high level um, and where you have noticed 
tendencies of weaknesses for recession proofing. So um, in the leadership level, do you notice any patterns in your clients around areas where they need help with leadership? Yeah, there's accountability is one of the biggest challenges from a leadership perspective in that we don't have those KPIs. I mean, the first question is uh, sometimes punches companies in the face because they haven't taken the time to really get clear on what the measures should be as far as uh, monitoring and measuring their success. Another area of challenge for much of leadership is communication. That's where I see the biggest breakdown in communicating to the organization, especially in the time of downturn. We need to be communicating on a daily basis. Here's where we're going, team. Everything's going to be okay. Here's how we're assessing it. Here's the plan. And just keeping everyone in the organization informed so that uh, there isn't panic that will cause uh, either people fleeing for the doors or uh, them to not be aggressive in getting out there and finding business and identifying opportunities to uh, keep the keep the business rolling. So that's you know, that precise insight is why we're wrapping up the fourth session on communications and communication strategy. There is a tendency to turtle when things are tough, when times are tough, that's exactly the opposite. You have to fight the tendency to get quiet during downturns and during times of tr struggle. That's when you have to begin over communicating to everybody, all your stakeholders. And it's honestly the opposite of the gut instinct that most of us have when we're starting to get a little panicked. So we're gonna talk about that for a whole 90 minutes in a, in a week, but I love that you highlighted that. The one that really punched me in the face was number five, which is like, we have defined the necessary personal, financial, and time sacrifices the leaders need to make. You yeah. know, this is leadership and leading by example. I, I think that that one really got me. I'm like, wow, I had not had that conversation with my wife yet. Now I have. Now I have. Uh, you want to go to the next session section? Yes, absolutely. So the the balance sheet is is obviously cat. We talk about cash. We talk about cash is king, but too often we wait too late before we start to really cut back on our expenses and uh, and get our balance sheet uh, looking looking good, refinancing any any debt that uh, might benefit from being refinanced as John Deere did. Uh, that's something that I did uh, the last time around as well when uh, we knew we were going to see some economic challenges. So we refinanced our debt. Uh, at a lower rate with a much lower payment. And thankfully, uh, we had done that just before COVID and that helped us, uh, one of our businesses survive COVID uh, as an example. Now, I didn't see COVID coming, to be really clear on that, but uh, that was yeah. in, in looking at the balance sheet and thinking about any preparation for challenges, that's, a, that's an action step that we took that really... Um, Again, that's if we hadn't done that, the business would be, would have been gone. You know, and listen, there there is a tendency to just look at this as like let's cut marketing, like let's just stop marketing, let's get really quiet. That's exactly the opposite of what you want to do. And I'm not just saying that uh, as someone who teaches and trains folks in marketing. It's much rather like how can we find because cutting off marketing is like cutting off your arm. It's cutting off your, it's like shutting down your growth engine. And it's basically conceding to flatline. That's a losing strategy. A winning strategy is saying things like, how can I improve my cash conversion cycle? How can I extend the terms with my vendors? So they let me pay them over a longer period of time. How can I collect faster with my current clients, right? Those are the sorts of things that you can be doing. How can we begin to leverage automation, right? To help us be uh, more efficient and not need as much human labor. Can we outsource any of our domestic resources overseas and get the same work done at a quarter of the cost, et cetera? Those are, especially at a time when you can't even hire for your open positions anyway. Uh, <laughs> balance sheet, uh, ne next section, I'm sorry. Yeah, so revenue. One of the one of the key the questions here is is question number two. We have sufficient diversity uh, in our revenue resources, so one or a few clients or market segments don't dominate uh, our total revenue. That has affected uh, one of my clients pretty significantly. And so, after taking this assessment, seeing the 
uh, overweighted client that they had, uh, they began a campaign to change and diversify. Not They didn't want to... Uh, to turn that revenue away, but they wanted to find other revenue sources so that it wasn't so they weren't so de dominant or dependent on one client. So that's that's just one example where you know reviewing this your revenue um, sources can can help you have a better plan, better strategy moving forward. What are some more thoughts, Dan? That's not downturn. That's just good business. You should not yeah. have any client represent more than more than twenty percent of your total revenue. Uh, a great example of this is I knew an agency that lived for 35 years with Ford as their primary client. They're the Hispanic agency for Ford. Well, Ford changed its uh, kind of agency of record. And that agency of record, which was owned by one of the conglomerates, wanted to gobble up the Hispanic part of the business. And so the agency was given a choice, either sell to the larger agency or lose the account. And losing the account meant going out of business. So they were forced, a 35-year business was forced into a sale because they were not sufficiently diversified in terms of their client base. So the risk here is massive if you depend too much on any one company. And then the other thing that was really kind of the punch in the face for me here is, are your clients recession-proof? Yeah, number four. That, one is, that is an analysis that I don't think anyone does on their own. It's like, not just are you recession proof, but is your client recession proof? And are they at risk? And what that led me to do, Russ, is I've done this assessment with every single one of my clients. Ooh, because the best way to recession proof a client is to get ready. That's right. So the way I'm recession proofing my clients is helping them prepare. That's exactly right. Absolutely. I love what you're doing there, Dan. They are benefiting um, and, and they'll, yeah. You next are one. an excellent supplier. And you know, you're 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 getting them to think about the stuff that's gonna first of all, it adds value, right? It's a little out of out of scope, right? I'm supposed to be doing marketing and I'm talking to them about how to survive a downturn. But the truth of the matter is their success is my success. If I have a tool that can help them, I'm not gonna keep it to myself. And they're gonna have a greater sense of loyalty to me. When they're looking at the optional costs, they're gonna see all the added value I'm bringing that's way beyond what they hired me to do. And I'm gonna be much more likely to survive. And because they're ready, they're gonna be more likely to survive too. Absolutely. So what about an expenses? This is where everybody goes first. Yes, cut, it, cut, cer cut, cut. it certainly does. But ahead of that, uh, why not classify? Let's classify our expenses. That's what question one is all about. Is do we? Is this a? Is this a have to have? Is it uh, important, uh, or is it one that's just nice to have? So identifying our expenses gives us an immediate place to go to to strike those expenses and you know, again preserve the core because uh, cash is king. And another one here, you mentioned it earlier. In uh, in the in the first session, um, from a lean perspective, is are we actively implementing lean practices in our organization? When times are good, we tend to get fat. Uh, what is it the the saying? Uh, hogs? What is it? Uh, pigs get fed, hogs get slaughtered. Well, that's uh, that's in our businesses. That happens almost unknowingly, especially when the cash is flowing. What other what other ideas and, and examples do you have, Dan? Yeah, you know, I, I I the one I've heard is when the tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked. <laughs> yes. Um, but I, I want to talk about this idea of critical to function versus kind of nice to have. Mm -hmm. We've been living for about a decade in a nice to have world, especially the last couple of years. Like money's been fast and easy and cheap. And we've been working in a lot of the nice to haves and that's got to stop immediately. Anything that's nice to have must stop. You, yeah. Everything you spend your time on has to be critical functions or you're not going to do well uh, in this uh, coming downturn. I, yeah. I did want to address one of the questions that came up um, from Mar Marshall Jones. He was responding to my recommendation that you outsource to overseas work. Uh, and he, I think he's asking here, you know, isn't that the cause of the problem? No, Marshall, that's not the cause of the problem. We have been in a global, we have been, the U.S. has had an acute labor shortage since pre-COVID. That labor shortage started in 2019, and it was accelerated by COVID. Uh, the great resignation, frankly, a million people dying, um, 
and uh, business kind of getting uh, booming in part through government money. Um, the labor shortage we have is going, usually labor shortages track with recessions. So when the recession happens, unemployment goes down, uh, goes up. Uh, that's not going to happen this time. You're going to see a continued labor shortage during a recession. It's one of the rarest events in all of economics, and you're about to experience it. You are not going to suddenly see a ton of new workers willing to work the way they used to work. This labor shortage is not limited to the United States. It is global. And what is happening is knowledge work is becoming globalized, whereas work that could be done at, let's call it, $15 an hour in the U.S. can be done for $5 an hour in the Philippines or Colombia or Argentina or Venezuela or Mexico. And guess what? That $5 an hour job in the Philippines or Mexico is a middle class wage. And they are better prepared and more eager to do it than any of us. And guess what? They're now starting to be in shortage. There is a global labor shortage. What's actually happening long term is a lot of that work is going to be automated through AI, machine learning, and robots. But in the meantime, if you as a small business are not leveraging overseas labor, you're really missing out on a big opportunity. Now, there are many of you who have businesses, retail stores, mosquito control services, where you physically need a human being to do the work. Costco, you should not treat your employees like Walmart. You should treat them like Costco. You should pay them twice the next level, and you should give them incredible benefits, and you should hang on to them with everything you got, and you should make it your job to hyper-serve your cut your employees, because if you don't, you're going to lose, right? The, the thing that too many small businesses have done for years is take for granted their employees, make good money themselves and underpay their staff. And as a result, there's no loyalty, folks leave and good for them, frankly. So overpay your people, treat them like family, and they will stick around through this recession and help you be that success case. And part of that is getting off the plate things that can be done in India or Sri Lanka or Philippines or, or Colombia for a much smaller amount of money and have the folks that are local do only the things that they can do and focus all their time on their highest and best use. That's my case for uh, outsourcing. And I got to tell you, you know, I'm in many business circles and the acceleration of movement of knowledge work overseas is breathtaking at the smallest business uh, level. And honestly, if you're not doing it as a small business, you're probably not getting ready for what's coming. That's, that is, uh, that is all well said, well said. And, you know, certainly. And this and, is a great segue into people. Yes. That's why I, you know, I popped that slide up in that retention strategy for key employees and it, Again, it's, it comes down to that communication, which you know that's the the next session that you're going to have. Um, but having regular communication with your team has proven. Gallup did a study, and employees that stay with their company have regular, meaningful conversations with their boss or with their leader. Uh, it doesn't necessarily it's it's whoever they're they report to, they're having conversations with those leaders on a weekly basis for at least a half an hour, ideally an hour. And it may not be about business. It's just about what's going on with them and, uh, and the leader asking, how can I support you? What do you need to succeed in your role? Uh, so engaging with our people is the number one strategy. They didn't talk about it in that video, but uh, that is a significant reason that those companies uh, succeeded and thrived. It was because they were able to retain their people because of the strategies that they put in place ahead of time. And then uh, those people were committed to success for that business when the time came. And I want to challenge number five. Uh, and I want to challenge you to be more creative than just cutting when it comes to labor cost reduction. 
I believe you can achieve a 10% labor cost reduction through automation and moving some low, you know, lower value or more rote work overseas than having to cut people's wages. That, that is one of the least motivating things you could possibly do to somebody at a time when they're probably struggling with inflation and other things. If you hold the line on salaries, even when the business is struggling a little bit, and then make it everybody's job to figure it out. That's a much better strategy than just cutting. And frankly, if you're going to cut, you got to start with yourself uh, and you got to lead by example. And so you need right now to be saving every dollar you have in preparation for cutting your salary. And, and shame on you, frankly, if you're a business owner who at, makes everybody else cut and then you're living high on the hog. Because mm. you know what? They're not going to stick with you. Yeah, they are watching and they know. It's amazing. They know everything. You know, one of my that's favorite examples of this was a... Uh, an absentee owner who would drive in once a month in his Corvette uh, and and work with his ten dollar an hour factory workers. Like, what are you doing? Do you know what I mean? Like, that is completely so demotivating, and it just it's just honestly, I think it's immoral, right? Like, you, you know, you're a small business, you're not Fortune five hundred company. You do not really. Is it the right thing for you to be making 30, 40, 50, 100 times your lowest paid employee? Does that really sound right to you? Does that really make sense? Do you really need to do that uh, in order for, for, for you to have the kind of lifestyle you need? Like you own the company, you own the equity in the company. One day, hopefully, you'll sell this company and you'll cash in or you'll give it to your kids. Like the equity is there. Do you really need to make so much more than they do? And guess what? They're watching, they know, and they will be loyal. Uh, depending on how you behave. Yeah, we say leader sets the pace. Leader sets the pace. So we talk about our customers and vendors. It's really important. You know, we talked about assessing the status of our customers, but what about our suppliers and vendors? You know, How prepared are they for a recession or a challenge that they would face in their business? Uh, where are we as it relates to our AR? Uh, are we overextended? Are we where we need to be? Um, how can we, as Dan mentioned earlier, uh, shorten that payment period? How can we get paid up front? What changes can we make there? Love what else it. comes to mind you here? Yeah, Jorge Menacal asked about, um, you know, online marketplaces where you can compare prices. Um, you know, it, it's hard to say in general, Jorge, whether that's a good recession strategy. Uh, but I will say this, uh, being a middleman, um, connecting buyers and sellers is a great business to be in. Fundamentally, that's really what Amazon is these days. Um, you know, and um, so depending on, on how much value you're adding as a middleman, uh, is it, it could definitely be a good business model. In many ways, BizHack is the same. We connect companies that need marketing strategy and leadership with fractional CMOs who can provide it. And we are the connector of the two. We provide training, we recruit them, and we make it really easy and out of the box you know, for a company to do that rather than having to recruit, hire, and train the person themselves. Um, but here, here's the thing I'll say about vendors. My biggest learning over the last year, if I had to make this my number one learning of the year, was that my vendor relationships are more important than my customer relationships. Mm. And I'll tell you why. I run a part-time outsourced head of marketing service. It's a, it's a combination uh, uh, of um, strategy, uh, staffing and 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 upskilling. When I place one of my CMOs, fractional CMOs, I tell the client, my goal is that in two years you hire a full time CMO, and that this is a bridge solution for you from before you're able to afford one to when you're able to afford one. And when we get to that point, we're going to celebrate it. We're going to help you recruit and hire that person, and we're going to give them the table set for incredible success. So my customer's lifetime with me is about two years on average. My vendor relationships, I hope are forever. They're gonna last for decades. And guess what? I send work to the vendors and vendors refer customers to me. And it's a virtuous cycle. It's a virtuous cycle, but they're longer term relationships. So when it comes down to it, if I have to pick between a customer and a vendor, someone who is a vendor to me, I'm gonna pick one of the people in my network, my vendor 
over my customer, right? Because customers come and go, but these vendors are long relationships. And, you know, Russ mm -hmm. is an example of that. Like Russ and I service very similar customers in different ways. And my hope is that Russ and I will send clients to each other, right? And, and so my goal is to build a long-term relationship with Russ that will outlast any single customer I might ever have. So that's why for me, for my business, my vendors are actually for, you know, higher on the food chain in terms of priority and care and feeding. And so then what does that mean? Is that I need to have a care and feeding strategy for my vendors. How do I support them? Well, one of the ways is I give them a platform to share their brilliance. So the masterclass series is part of the value add that comes with being a partner to BizHack. Sorry, go ahead. No, I appreciate that. All of that is uh, is an excellent example uh, of how that virtuous cycle uh, can be made. It's it's really about helping others in our network succeed and those that uh, that support us and and those we support. So any number of ways to do that. Uh, on the technology side, what is uh, the status of your technology? Are you vulnerable? Have you leveraged technology? Uh, for that cost savings, as Dan mentioned, uh, there are uh, opportunities to you know, leverage savings out there uh, in the market, but it's really assessing how vulnerable are we to the market. What other, what else would you add here, Dan? No, no uh, automation is an incredible cost saving strategy. Um, you can waste a, a lot of time and money on it, but if you map out your operational and marketing journeys, and you look for areas where you where there are rote tasks that could potentially be automated, and then you invest the time in doing that, you will save a lot of money. Um, one of my businesses, Mosquito Joe of Miami, is a pest control services business. And through automation, they were able to save two to three full-time operational people and give better customer service. A great example, is every time they're required that by every time they acquire a new customer, they write a handwritten thank you note. And so all the other franchises in the country have literally a human being writing a handwritten thank you note uh, repetitively, you know, getting carpal tunnel syndrome to eight hours a day. And he has been able to automate it so that there is a company that does uh, mechanically written handwritten notes takes care of the hand the, the, the handling of it, the mailing of it. He has um, pipes and APIs that send them the data when somebody enrolls in his system. And so somebody signs up and within 20 minutes in the mail is the handwritten note, right? That looks identical in every way to the one that a human being would have written. Uh, it's cheaper, it's faster, and it allows him to focus on the real core of his business, which is spraying for mosquitoes. And you can't outsource that. You can't hire in India for that. That's the right. About those guys is those guys are in big demand right now, you know, because spraying outdoors and mosquitoes in places like South Florida ain't too much fun. <laughs> right? So you could when you could work indoors. So so he needs to work really hard to recruit and retain those folks. And that's really the core of his business. And to hire someone to handwrite those notes is not the core of his business. It's a necessary activity that he needs to get done. And he's found ways to do enough, find enough things like that that allows, allowed him to save on two to three full-time people for a $3 million a year business. And there's another example uh, of a dance studio in Doral I like to talk about, uh, Ascend Dance Studios, Rafael Savino. He's been able to automate his front desk person. And so he's now basically able to send reminders to parents, automated, uh, have people check in. Uh, and it's actually a smoother and faster process. And he's been able to save money on that front desk person and that has allowed him to survive COVID. If he had not done that, he would probably not have survived COVID. So my biggest recommendation around technology is see if you can find operational automations uh, to help you save money so that you, and that use that as a labor reduction strategy. And then the people who are there are not doing rote tasks, but they're doing tasks that only a human being can do, like teaching dance classes or spraying for mosquitoes. That's right. Yeah, that's the core activity, right? That is the business. That is the core. 
protect and preserve the core. I, from a technology perspective, one of the things that uh, that we did our, at our prosthetics business is we had a very old server and we were trying to just piecemeal it together and 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 we're spending really more money trying to figure it out ourselves versus outsourcing to a technology professional that knew what they were doing. And so once we we finally took the leap and invested with a company that knew what they were doing as opposed to us just trying to figure it out on our own, it really changed our technology uptime. So uh, in as it relates to technology, sometimes we think we're better off doing it on our own, but the reality is finding a professional is going to save you far more than it's going to cost you. It's an investment, not an expense. It's really well said. It's probably the biggest mistake I've made in my business has been around automation uh, and trying to do it myself and doing it badly and wasting literally years of time in the, res in the result. Absolutely. So everyone should have at this point. Yep. Uh, and they have, I have about 10 great responses here. We're going to go over. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Should I, should I stop the uh, the screen share? Yeah, just show them this, show them that circle, and talk them through kind of how the, uh, you know, what it could look like if they're doing this by hand, and then we'll actually go and show the screen of results. Yeah, exactly. So what we what we do is we we mark. So if we scored a seven on expenses, as an example, uh, we would we would mark the seven uh, with a with a marker if we had this printed out, and then. Essentially, it's just a visual for identifying, you know, in this example, technology and our balance sheet are the two areas in our business that uh, we need to pay particular attention to because the, the goal is to increase our score. By increasing the score, it's going to increase our readiness for any challenge that we're going to face in our business. So any questions are on that? Yeah, perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. Okay. Uh, we have one question. Uh, can you share the name of the front desk automation company? Well, Leslie, here's the bad news. <laughs> the bad news is he had to build it all himself. Um, I think uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the, there's a software he used, uh, similar to HubSpot. Um, I'll, I'll remember the name. But he had to build the automations himself because those automations are very specific to what his company needs. And and kind of the the there aren't that it's very difficult to find an out of the box automation solution. Um, you generally have to build it for the specific needs of your company. And that's part of the reason why small businesses struggle so much with it, like me, because it's there's no solution for it. So uh, you know, unfortunately, Raphael used to work at uh, Amazon, he's an incredible technologist and he just built the automations uh, himself. Um, so, all right, so here we are. Um, can you see my screen okay? Got it. So uh, we have uh, a number of great folks. Um, are we able to get the checklist in a PDF? Yes, Amy Williams, we'll be sending that to you in an email. Um, and I agree, this is vital information. So you can see here, uh, on leadership, right? Uh, lots of different answers, but um, you know, a lot uh, like certain certain areas where we're seeing kind of patterns uh, of zeros. Like for instance, a couple of you said we invest in our leadership team's development and the development of every team member. So training, right? Uh, a couple of you, a lot of you are not doing enough in that area, ones and zeros. So that's uh, an example of an area. Uh, where there's maybe a weakness there. What we're going to ask you to do, I think, right, is to pick three uh, of sure. these 30, uh, 35 for, for focus, and then he's going to walk you through a tool on what to do about it. Um, so, for instance, for, for some of you, uh, L3 is going to be an important one, right? Uh, in technology, you can see here uh, that we have a lot of folks uh, with zeros and ones under, we have a good understanding of how our competitors are leveraging technology. So maybe an action is for you to go and look into how your competitors are making use of technology. A lot of you also say, um, we, we have a strong tech team, no we don't, right? So maybe it's time for you to get uh, a fractional C, uh, CTO uh, or to get an agency partner that can provide some technology or development resources to support you. Yeah, uh, certainly an area that's easily outsourced, right? 
Exactly. You know, this is an area where you can just find someone to just run this. It probably won't take more than a few hours a month uh, and they'll give you incredible results. Um, some of you do not have uh, a retention strategy and you are at big risk if that's your case uh, for not doing that. Um, th you also um, uh, should be thinking about a cost uh, labor cost reduction strategy. Labor for most small businesses is their number one expense. And so how can you get the same uh, or better service for less money? With the customer and vendor side, uh, I see a lots of, uh, it's interesting, you can see in this one, either they're really good at it or, um, mm. uh, or they don't do it at all. Um, one of the, um, which is basically uh, favorable credit terms with our vendors. So here's here's a really big insight. When you need money, there's a couple places you can go if you're in a real pinch. You know, obviously you have friends and family, you have your own personal savings, you have the company's uh, emergency fund, but honestly, one of the best places to go is your vendors, right? That's why those are long-term relationships. And some vendors, you know, if they're doing okay with cash flow, will extend, you know, 30, 60, 90 days. That's essentially a loan. And that's a great way for you if you're not able to make payroll Look to your vendors potentially before uh, looking to your own employees to I'll help. Give, uh, I'll give you an example on that, Dan. So we, one of the businesses that uh, that I invested in was a prosthetics business. We bought the business for a dollar, and uh, it was four hundred thousand dollars in debt. The vendors were not paying us, so uh, we, when we took the business over, we immediately uh, talked with the supplier or with our suppliers and vendors, and said, "Hey, we are we are in this for the long term." And they extended terms out 90 days so that we could begin to get the product flowing into our organization. We could serve our patients again. There you go. And here's the flip side of that on the balance sheet side is can you offer the same, you know, service uh, to your customers? Can you extend their payment terms? I did this with one of my clients. Uh, she had a short term cash crunch. And so I've given her kind of essentially a five month loan uh, that she will, she will pay back. Uh, and, you know, that's a way to build kind of a long term relationship. You know, I'm at risk, right, because uh, that money is being loaned and there's no, uh, you know, firm promise of paying back. They could always walk away. Uh, but, you know, in the end, um, I know I'm going to one day need my vendors to extend that to me. And I, I like to do that because these are long term relationships. It looks like everybody's weak on revenue. Number four, we've evaluated our market. And yeah, this is the one that punched me in the That's face. Understandable. Sure. Yeah, it's like knowing which of your clients are well positioned in the downturn uh, is a huge kind of thought experiment that I'd recommend. And then finally, uh, on the expenses side, um, I'm seeing uh, a lot stronger uh, performance here in many of you where you're really already working on your expenses. I'm not surprised. Uh, people tend to work on their expenses uh, first, it's where they start. Uh, that is, you you can also cut yourself to death, so you got to be careful <laughs> not to overdo it, uh, especially when it comes to business development and marketing. Now is not the time to get quiet, as uh, Henry Ford said. Um, so, Russ, uh, take us through the next phase of our conversation. Sure. Yeah. Now we want to identify three priorities that uh, I'm going to take you through the action tool where we are going to uh, talk about the uh, fast rock planner should be do you see me okay there we go all right so we identify what area that we want to work on or focus on and then we're going to use the fast rock planner which is essentially a project management tool to help us get clear on the steps that we need to be taking, put some timelines and time frames uh, around executing on the plan. So we will, so the fast rock planner, so fast is the new smart. There was a study done at MIT where they evaluated an alternative acronym for uh, doing our goals or setting our goals. Oftentimes we talk about the smart, setting smart goals. Uh, what they determined is this acronym better serves in actually completing 
our goals more quickly. So frequently reviewed, though those are our goals that uh, as a team, we are reviewing on a regular basis. Uh, they are ambitious uh, in and have a motivating component to get the team excited. They are very specific, of course, there are, they get that clear. Here's what winning means. Here's what it means when we hit this goal. Here's how we will know that we've achieved this objective. And transparent is, it, we want to have transparency throughout our organization, especially as our organizations grow and get larger. We don't want to have the service department working on uh, decreasing the time that it takes for them to be able to provide service and our inventory management folks trying to redu reduce inventory at the same time. So th those are two competing goals in the same organization because we need the uh, we need the inventory in order to serve our clients in a more uh, in a faster manner. So that's what transparent means. It means that we're talking about it throughout the organization and uh, and having these conversations. Can everyone see the fast track planner that we've got pulled up here? Yes. All right. Excellent. So if if there's anyone that would want to to talk through or work through a specific rock, if there's something well, we call them rocks and and rocks, uh, if you're not familiar with rocks, I'll just go through. Uh, Stephen Covey came up with the idea of rocks as the priorities in our lives. And the way that he demonstrated that is he took some large rocks. He had some aggregate or gravel and he had some sand. And what he did was he had the person doing the demonstration put the sand in. Those are the cares of life. And then they put the gravel in. Those are the things that matter a, a little bit more than the, than the things that don't matter, which is the sand. And then by the time the container, it comes to putting in the things that matter, which he called the rocks. So the things that matter in our life don't fit in the jar. So the, the rock came up because we want to put the rocks in first. That's where our focus needs to be. Then we put the aggregate in, then we put the sand in, and that allows us to prioritize our focus. And that's your know, rocks or goals. Uh, it's kind of an interchangeable um, terminology. So just want to clarify what rocks are. So any questions on the Fast Rock Planner? Do we have a volunteer? Does anyone want to, want to go through or work through this Fast Rock Planner with us? Uh, let's promote Steve Kroll up uh, as one of the uh, panelists, please, um, Jonathan. And uh, just to re reiterate, you're going to get this PDF uh, as well as the uh, other PDF, the discovery tool, uh, in a follow-up email tomorrow along with a link to this. And then um, highly recommend you print this out and do this with your team. Hi, Steve. I like your picture, the fonds, and uh, I forgot his name, the redhead. Hello. Do you want my video on too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I need this cool yeah. background. Yeah. Thank you, guys. So, um, so Russ, uh, Steve runs an agency, uh, a marketing agency. He's a, one of those vendors that I value so much. Uh, he's also in a group. Uh, I'll give a little plug for the Small Giants community. And uh, he and I met uh, and had an amazing evening together uh, in Detroit uh, in April. And uh, we fell in love. <laughs> we're brothers from another mother and and uh really have a great love and respect for each other uh so uh so russ take it away all right very good so steve uh thanks for volunteering and and participating in this fast rock exercise so the goal here is to demonstrate and share with everyone how we the thought process so this should take us really it, it typically would only take anywhere from five to 15 minutes to work through one of these fast rock planners um, as an individual, sometimes as a team, it might take a little longer as you debate over what steps in the, in the timing for each of those steps. So, uh, Steve, what, uh, what would be the title for this goal or for your rock? Well, I would play the game of financial planning ahead of the downturn. Financial planning ahead of the downturn. All right. So oftentimes we love to put a, a fun spin on a, on a title. Um, so building, building our financial fortress or something to that effect. Okay, cool. Our creating our bulwark. All right. So describe the rock when this rock is done. So a big part of success in life and business as 
everyone participating probably knows is vision, having a vision in the way that we uh, we begin every exercise. So your your business was a vision prior to it becoming an actual uh, business that you worked in. Uh, every skyscraper was a vision in an architect's head before it was actually put on paper and then created. So everything that happens in our lives begins with a vision that, uh, that we begin to work through. So that's why this description is so uh, critically important to us articulating why this rock matters, because we'll know through the description if it doesn't matter. So Steve, how would you describe this rock? Uh, what When it's completed, what does, what does it look like for your business? On 1231 of 2023, we're looking back and we haven't just survived whatever the economy is doing, but we've thrived. We've grown through it. We pivoted and we're singing and dancing because we made our annual dreams come true. Love it. Love it. So that's something that we can all visualize and, and get our arms around. Uh, so why is this rock important? It seems to go without reason or without saying, but and one word would be survival. Yes. Uh, I think to Dan's point earlier, and, and I've, I've been hearing this over and over, right? The turtle, the turtle concept, we all get fear initially. And what we have to do is we have to respond to that. We have to come to life for it. And we've got to look past it. It's not a good or bad economy. It's a different economy. And those that have a plan as such that y'all have talked about all day today, those that have a plan increase their odds of succeeding by, by, by infinite numbers. Absolutely. You're exactly right. So, so that's right. It is critically important to the survival of your business. All of our employees, all of your employees are counting on you and your team to uh, take the appropriate steps to be physically responsible. So what would be step number one in uh, assessing or creating your financial bulwark? Wow, um, put me on the spot here. I, I think I have to understand, um, I have to understand my three key financial statements. I have to understand what my PL is doing. I have to understand what my cash position looks like, which is going to be incredibly important for the next 12 months. And then I also have to understand my balance sheet. So there's this, this understanding of what my what my assets are, if you will, and what my liabilities are at the top level so that I can understand what I have to do in the next steps. How much money do I have to save and when? Absolutely. So step number one, uh, assessing current cash position as uh, that's one of one of those that you that you cool. mentioned. Uh, in there. So as of right now, here's here's where we are. If you if you have access to a fractional CFO, that is an, that is a wonderful resource to help do those cash flow projections into the future. And then you can work with a fractional CFO on modeling for uh, presenting, you know, if we if we reduce these unnecessary expenses, uh, how will that impact our future cash? And so you can begin to play with those particular, uh, the particulars on the revenue side, as well as the expense side to understand uh, where your break-even point is and then uh, where, how, how your cash position today would survive uh, as revenue dried up into the future. So, uh, so another, so assessing your cash position, that's as easy as just looking to see, looking under the hood and finding out, you know, what cash you have. So, so number two, uh, I don't know if that, idea of a fractional CFO or engaging with a financial professional to help you do this evaluation. How would you feel about that, Steve? Um, I think it'd be awesome. I think, uh, you know, you can never, during situations like this, you can never get enough eyes or advice. And as much as you can take in, you certainly have to filter through it, but um, the more the better without getting too confused or too fragmented. Absolutely. Love it. So, so find a pro, find a, find a CFO would, uh, would be what I would put in there as a potential step number two for you. Uh, so there are people that assess these uh, financial, your finances for a living, uh, engage them and allow them to do that work. That's what they do best. Uh, so what would, what would step number three be? Well, I think it really depends on what the CFO has to say, but I think there's um, prioritizing changes at that point, right? Because that, that generalizes what a CFO might come back with. 
to say, hey, do we have to cut costs? Do we have to worry about payroll and staffing? What's our client situation? So you can start understanding where the money's going. Love it. Absolutely. Create an action plan. That's exactly what would happen after uh, receiving the feedback from the uh, the CFO. Or if you have the capacity and capability of of doing that CFO work, then then clearly uh, you know, that person that's qualified will do that work as well. So you've created an action plan. Now what? Big action. Get after it. Um, it's all got to be trackable and reportable, right? I got to be able to follow up on it, make sure what I've got. But I think that's my final step. I think taking action is step four. And the final step is tracking my progress. Actually, well, I would I would put one step in between there, and that would be communicating the plan with the team. So we want to we want to oh, cool. we want everyone to have confidence in the future. Everyone in the organization to feel confident that leadership uh, has taken the appropriate measures, has identified a strategy and a plan to keep them around for the long term. So communicating that, as we talked about earlier, critical to maintaining your talent. And then, uh, and then certainly, you know, taking action. And in the action, maybe based on the plan, you won't need immediate action, but you'll know the levers or the the numbers that when those markers hit, uh, you know the action that you'll need to take uh, based well, on what you're seeing. Tough, tough places to be, but I get it. I get it. They're hard hard to pinpoint those numbers, but uh, you're absolutely right. They need to be there. Absolutely. Now, the next step in this is is identifying the resources needed for completion. So what resources come to mind? Well, I need a CFO. Absolutely. Then, um, the resources there, I mean, when I think of resources, I think of humans. We're a marketing services organization, so I don't have much outside of my humans. Um, and that is engaging the leadership team. I need I need them to be part of this ride. I can't uh, I can't walk down from the mountaintop with two tablets. They'll just shoot at me. <laughs> Amen to that, right? So engage the team and, and allow them to help put this plan together. So love it. Those are exactly the resources that I would recommend is, you know, identify that uh, outsourced or fractional CFO that can provide the guidance and then uh, make sure that the team is engaged and involved in helping to make those decisions as well. So love it. Thank you, Steve, so much. Any questions, any thoughts on that process? Um, Probably, but in reality, what this session has done for me is sort of solidified my thinking about the path that we, we started a few months ago, not because of the economy, but for other reasons. And you're helping me sort of refine what the next three months look like, what Q1 of next year. Actually, I have a question while I'm here. Um, we've decided to forego full annual planning for 2023, instead focusing on hey, you know what, we need to get it right in Q1. So I don't want to spend the time spending all that energy on 2023 planning and focus on sort of writing the ship or being the, the right boat in the storm in Q1. What are your feelings on that? So I I prescribe to the 73190 plan. And so I want to have my seven-year uh, plan laid out there. And I know, you know people say times change and they absolutely change. That's why we revisit it on a regular basis. But so we have our seven year uh, vision. We have three year milestones that that confirm that we are on track for hitting that seven year vision. And we've got that that one year plan, I think, is is the most critical from a stability perspective. Uh, we you know, we're not we're certainly not fortune tellers or soothsayers. We don't know what's going to happen into the future. But it's it, when when we don't do that, it's almost like we are giving up uh, on that. Now, I know there are some companies that prescribe to the uh, 12 week business plan model or, you know, the, the but I just uh, I want to have that bigger vision for the year and then have everyone work working on achieving those objectives. And then if we've got the the downturn plan in the background and we've, we've got it ready to deploy as necessary. But if we if we're already thinking that things are going to be going to be bad and we need to hunker down and, and they're going to be issues, then I think that can that can cause some stagnation in the organization and and be more fear oriented as opposed to proactive in in going after winning the business and doing what's necessary to thrive instead of just survive. So so that's that's my take and Dan or you know others might have a, a different perspective on it. 
Uh, yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and Steve, thank you so much for, um, you know, being our guinea pig and, 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 and sharing. And I look forward to seeing you next week when you're in town. So, Russ, um, we're going to be wrapping up here. And you had four things that every CEO needs to do. And I don't yes. want to run time before you share those. Absolutely. Well, let's just let's just hop right to it. So uh, there are four things that I recommend to every business leader. And this doesn't matter whether you are in a solopreneur type of situation, you're just one person, or if you are in an organization where you've got uh, 500 employees. These are the four things, four investments that every CEO should make. Uh, and, and I can say this with confidence because this is what I have done, and it's really, really helped me in uh, in all of my business ventures. Uh, find a peer group, whether it's the Entrepreneurs Organization, Vistage, Convene, C12. Uh, there are a number of peer groups that are out there where you can get around like-minded uh, individuals, CEOs, people that are on the same path. I would say maybe not like-minded, but people that are on the same path and going through the same challenges that you are as leaders. It's certainly lonely at the top, and uh, and you can't necessarily talk uh, to your employees about the challenges that you're experiencing because you don't want to spook them. So find a peer group where you can share, you can have that open dialogue and 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 do that with confidence and in a confidential uh, manner. So number two is find a coach. So uh, anyone committed to excellence needs a coach. So find someone, obviously that's what I do for a living. I'm a little bit biased because that is what I do for a living, but I have had coaches all along the way. They have kicked me in the, in the butt. They have picked me up uh, any number of uh, ways that coaches can help us thrive. You know, you think about the the most successful in our country, specifically from a sports perspective. That's what we often come back to as an analogy. Is uh, you know, Tiger Woods had a had a had a coach. You know, every actor has a coach. So people that succeed and thrive have a coach. Alan Mulally, uh, he had a coach. Marshall Goldsmith was uh, was his coach. So. These uh, ultra successful people uh, all have coaches and and they vary as far as the the investments that you would need to make for a coach. So so don't allow those finances to to prevent that from happening. Uh, an operating system. Obviously, I'm a little biased. I, I implement the business operating system called Pinnacle. Uh, I did use EOS in my other businesses, but regardless of the system that you choose, uh, it's important that you have a system, a framework uh, with which you are helping uh, to manage your business, because that's ultimately how we are able to build a self-managing business is by having a system that everyone understands the mechanics of the system and things get done. We've got KPIs, we've got a regular communication, and we have these things called rocks that everyone is responsible for because we know that is what moves the organization forward toward our seven-year objective. And then uh, identifying a fractional CFO or full-time CFO, depending on the size of your organization. CFOs are critical. I would say, you know, uh, CPAs are fantastic and they they are they provide a great service, but oftentimes the CPA is looking in the rearview mirror. Your PL is what happened in the past. The, the, the balance, you know, you know the, the information that we're receiving from our accountant is about the past. And what a CFO does is they take that data from the past and they use it as a projection into the future and really help us to drive through the windshield as opposed to the rearview mirror. So getting that uh, that CFO guidance uh, is really helpful. So in, if you if you are to do all four of these, uh, expect to invest you know twenty four thousand dollars a year, anywhere to a hundred thousand dollars a year, depending on the uh, the experience and the skill set of the individuals that you're engaging with. Uh, so that's those are the four things that I would recommend that uh, every CFO or I mean every business leader CEO get involved with. So. Excellent. How I can help, uh, just to, to wrap up that, so we can do a you know forty five minute uh, strategy session, no cost, decipher your assessment, discuss strategies, talk through fast rocks. Um, I do a a cohort as well that can help and uh, has all four of those different uh, resources in. And if you want a free book, just reach out. There's my email address, and I will mail you the uh, the Pinnacle book. So, with that. I will let Dan take over or answer any questions that might come up. Perfect. And uh, yeah, Russ comes with my highest recommendation. Russ, you can also go ahead and throw your uh, email address and phone number in the chat if you'd like. Um, we're going to be wrapping up here. Uh, if there are any questions, 
uh, please put them in the Q&A now. I see Amy uh, Williams mentioned number four, um, which is something she did in the middle of the pandemic in 2020. Remind me what number four was. Oh, that was hiring a fractional Hire CFO. CFO. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so very few of your businesses that are on this call right now need a CFO, but right. you, a full-time CFO, right? But you do Absolutely. need a CFO. Um, and to his point, CFOs are forecasting. They're looking in the front mirror uh, through the front windshield. And then your accountant, your bookkeeper, um, you, those are folks are, who are looking in the rear view mirror. Revenue is a lagging indicator. So most of us, and cash is a lagging indicator. So most of us kind of, <laughs> the number one thing we do is we just track our checking account. How much money do we have in there? That's a rear view mirror indicator. And mm -hmm. if you're not careful, you're going to run out of cash. And you have one job. One job is CEO. It's not run out of money. It's the only way businesses die is they run out of money. So if you want to summarize those 35 things, they're all about strategies you can use to not run out of money when money becomes a little tighter. Absolutely. So, so focus on hiring someone who's a CFO. Uh, I, I, I brought my, uh, I myself uh, hired a fractional CFO. And for the first time ever in 2023, uh, I will have a um, forecast that I believe in for next year. You know, I've gone through the exercise of creating a forecast, but I didn't believe it. Yeah, it wasn't. It was just an exercise, and uh, there's nothing worse than spending a year uh, measuring your performance against the budget you don't believe in. I got to tell you, I hated it. So this well, year I'm like, okay, this year I'm going to do one that I actually believe in, so that when I'm tracking my performance, it's performance that I really take seriously. You were going to say? I, I just talk to my clients all the time about this is about turning pro. So we want to we want to turn pro in our businesses. And take it's really we take our businesses seriously. It's when we when we make investments in our business, uh, like a fractional CFO or someone that can help provide us with the appropriate guidance. That is an investment in the future of our organization. So, uh, kudos to you for making that investment. Um, and uh, it's Russ at ownyourcategory.com. Correct. That is correct. Okay. So yeah, that's the correct uh, email, and then. Um, you know, the other three elements, uh, get a personal coach, uh, be a part of a peer group of other business owners, and um, uh, have some operating system for your business, uh, some cadence of meetings and some way of prioritization and setting strategies and goals that are longer term and shorter term. Business 101. Absolutely. Business 101. The peer group is a lot about self-care. It's very lonely at the head of a table. So take care of yourself because you're not going to find anyone inside of your company that can be a shoulder to cry on. Really, you're you're not. That's not their job to be your consolation. That's the job of other business owners. Uh, hire a coach, just like you fire, hire a personal trainer to better your mind for the work that is required, the energy that is required of being a CEO. In the end, CEOs are chief energy officers. And you need to take good care of yourself and, and preserve your energy. And a coach can help you with that. Uh, and, and, you know, when I'm a writer, professional writer, and I like to say that every writer needs an editor and every business owner needs a coach. It's very hard when you're in the muck, in the, de the day to day, even if you're a professional writer like I am, you still need someone to look over your shoulder and help provide you some expert guidance. And investing in that is going to be the best investment you can make. With that, I want to say thank you. We'll see you in one week from today to talk about communications during a downturn with the amazing Jennifer Hudson of Think Beyond Communications. Thanks again to the mayor's office for sponsoring these masterclasses and to you, Russ, for being such an amazing uh, and giving and generous expert presenter. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate the opportunity, Dan. I wish every one of you a great new year. Have a safe holiday season. Appreciate you very much. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye.